any questions at, at any point um, uh, if you're not clear and then we can get, get moving together. So let's start with the vision, okay? Um, the Bible says it this way, that without uh, a vision, people perish. Where there is no vision, people perish, okay? Uh, this is so important. So in other words, uh, unless we have clear understanding, our labor and our efforts can be futile, right? Our labor and our efforts could be not, you know, going in the right direction unless people understand the vision. And I think that that is my, my, my role as a leader is to impart vision into the people. And I think that for every single one of you, whether you're a cell leader, whether you're a team leader, the question is, do the people understand what the vision is? Okay? Do they understand the overall vision, okay, for the church? And do you have a vision for where you are? Does your cell group have a vision? Does your team have a vision? Do you, are you taking people somewhere? If you're not taking people anywhere, then they're not gonna come on board. You understand what I'm saying? Nobody jumps in a car going nowhere, okay? People move in a, jump into a moving vehicle. So we must understand a vision. Okay, let me show you something here. Let's go to, uh, I think numbers. Let's go to I don't want to use Exodus. I don't want to use Exodus. Share the burden of the people, share the burden of the people, share the burden of the people. Just give me a second. There's numbers. Okay, let's go to Numbers chapter 11 verse 16. Let's go to Numbers chapter 11. So we all know the story of when Moses um, is being advised by Jethro and Jethro tells Moses that you can't do everything by yourself, okay? Go and pick up other people to work with you. Um, numbers chapter, what did I said, Numbers what? 11, 11 huh? Okay, alright. From verse 16. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather before me 70 men who are recognized, right, as elders and as leaders of Israel, okay? Gather before me 70 men who are recognized as elders and as leaders of Israel, okay? The first thing I want you to understand here is that there are people who are called, right, and they were recognized by leadership. So the first thing I want you to see here is even as a leader, you're not just a leader by title, right? You're not just a team leader by title. People must recognize that you do lead. You understand what I mean? And recognition is not based on, on you throwing your weight around, but it will be seen in what you do. You understand what I'm saying? It will be seen in your efforts. It says, it says, bring them to the tabernacle to stand there with you, okay? The first thing I want you to understand is that as team leaders in any section, you are here to stand with me, right? In the area of the vision, okay? And this is so important. This is so important because it's possible to lead a team but not lead the team towards the vision, right? It's possible to lead a cell group but not lead a cell group towards the vision, right? So the first thing that we must understand is that it's important for us to be in unison, right? And working towards a, an, an intended goal. It's like four tires. The four tires of a vehicle all move in the same direction. The minute the tires are not going in the same direction, there's bound to be an accident, right? There's bound to be a problem. They have to work towards the same direction, okay? So 
that they must stand with you there. Right? It says, I will come down and talk with you. I will take some of the spirit that is upon you. So the second thing that you see there is that the vision is not just a manifesto. It's not just the word. It's a spirit that we all carry. Are, are you guys hearing me? That, that, that whatever we call our vision must become your spirit. You understand? Whatever we call our vision must become your spirit. You, might, you, you don't say, oh, this is what Pops wants. You know, I don't know. You know? You know? What just do? It must become your spirit. It must become your language. It must become your desire. You understand what I'm saying? Because the Bible says the spirit that is upon Moses was put upon the people. So whatever was in Moses was upon them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay? So it talks about being united in spirit. So we, we talked about leaders being recognized. Number two, that they stand together with the vision. Number three, they carry the spirit of the vision, right? It says, now take the spirit that's upon you, put them, uh, 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 the spirit also upon them. They will bear the burden of the people along with you, and you will not have to carry it alone. The very first thing that, you, that if there's anything that you take away from here as a team leader, right? Or as a section leader, as a cell leader, is that you are called to carry the burden of the ministry, okay? You are called to carry the burden of the ministry. Okay? The difference between church, the kingdom, and any other institution is that in other institutions are there for a salary. You understand what I'm saying? It's a fact. No matter how good the leadership principles are, you're there for a salary, right? But there's a difference between an employee and a shareholder, right? There's a difference between an employee and a stakeholder. Because an employee just cares about his check. A stakeholder cares about the livelihood, right? The continuity, the progress of the institution. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, an employee cares about what is in his email box. You understand? A stakeholder cares about how is business going overall. You see the difference? Okay. And, and I believe that the people who received Moses' spirit became stakeholders in this vision. You understand what I'm saying? They, they didn't just become, oh, assistant in whatever. They became stakeholders in the vision. And this is so important because last week we put out the vision, right? To begin to put out the direction of where we are. And you, you heard that we, it was also mentioned in the cell groups, right? It was in cell groups as well. So... I don't know who's, is it in there or outside? Can you just ask them to, yeah, if they can. So, it, it, it's very important that, that the vision is, is uh, somebody else? Okay. It's okay. It's very important that this vision is something that you take time to not just hear, but you must digest this vision. Okay? That you must understand this vision. That not only must you understand this vision, but that you must see your role in this vision. Okay? That you must see your position in this vision. Are you, are you guys hearing me? Okay? Because it's all good that we did it, you know, and we launched it. But we've got to now begin to take this vision and make it real. Okay? Are we together? So, let's go through the vision as we talked about. As a church, we want to talk about impacting the community in three spheres, right? We showed this obviously on Sunday, those of you who were here, those of you who weren't here. The first thing is that we want to serve the community, okay? Serving the community is the way that we show love to the community, okay? What we desire is not just be spiritually prevalent, but to be culturally relevant to the community as well, okay? We're there to impact, influence, help the community, okay? And that's obviously not just through drawing them to the church, but we think that charity, right, is the way in. There must be good deeds with the good news. When, when, when good deeds come first, it gives you goodwill, and goodwill opens up people's heart to receive the new good news. Are you understanding what I'm saying? 
Okay. The Bible says that, 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 that Jesus enters Peter's boat. Right? And Peter, Peter had not really followed Jesus. He just gave Jesus his boat. Right? Jesus preached an entire message. People were probably like, ooh, this guy's fire. Because Jesus was preaching for a long time. Okay? But Peter still had an issue. And Peter's issue was that he was going home empty-handed. Okay? Jesus noticed that the gospel was incomplete until Peter's needs were met. Okay? Because everyone was being fed. Those who wanted to hear the word were fed with the word. Peter didn't come for the word. Peter came for fish. Are you guys hearing me? Not everybody comes, you know, for the word. This is a fact. Right? Mm -hmm. But the, when the word is preached, it must encompass solutions with it. You understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. It must change people's lives. It must transform them from where they are to where God wants them to be. And before there can be transformation, needs must be met. Okay? Peter goes home with a boatload of fish. And he says, hey, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. When his need was met, he repented. Okay? When his need was met, he repented. What am I trying to say? We must care about the needs of the people. We must care. Okay? Can I now come bring it back to team leaders now? So this is what always happens in church. If Anybody has a serious need. Everyone washes their hands and says, ah, this one is for pastor. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? In fact, <clears throat> I don't know how many times I sit here, I could be minding my own business and somebody would just, king, 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 king. Pastor, this person wants to see you. Right? And at the end of the day, you realize they had a need, but anybody could have met that need if they just took time to listen to them, right? If they just took time to hear them. And I think that this is one of the problems with the church today. We don't take time to hear the community. We don't take time to hear what people are really going through. We already have the message. It's like we're just waiting to say, ah, whatever you say, Jesus is the answer. You understand? I'm divorced. Yes, but Jesus is that. It is true. That is true. I'm not negating that. Right? But the Bible says that we must be quick to do what? To listen. Slow to speak. Think about that. That we must be quick to do what? To listen. And then we must be slow to speak. So maybe what we need to do in order to meet these needs is to listen more. You know? Of course, you're going to meet people that are going to talk, you know, ill about your church, talk ill about, you know, anybody. I, I, I mean, one guy one time met me outside the bank. And, you know, he says, like, I was convinced that you're a playboy. I was like, me? <laughs> me? Player? Me? Because he just saw what my car looked like. So he just concluded. Black rings equals this guy plays games. You understand what I mean? But it's okay. But you see, what I've learned is that many times when we, we can either win an argument or win a soul. You got two choices. Win an argument or win a soul. Okay? So we want to serve the community. We want to listen to the community. The second thing that we want to do is our vision is to grow in community. I want you to see that community is key here. Right? What we believe, what we see is the importance of community. Okay? You will hear this word throughout, the, throughout our message. Community. Okay? And the first one can really much be summed as charity. The second one is community. 
The third one is creativity. But throughout all of these three things is community. We serve the community, those on the outside of the church. When we draw them in, we don't bring them into a church. We bring them into a community. Are you guys hearing me? Mm-hmm. This is the message that we have to preach. This is the message that we must begin to speak, that we are a community. Okay? How does this relate to you? It means there's more to life than your team. There's more to life than your cell group. There's a whole community. Right? And the community, come on in. And the community must be accommodating. Okay? This is so important. The community must become accommodating to people. Because not all communities accommodate. Right? I was saying the other day um, that I think that as church people, we can switch on the light there before it gets dark. I think as church people, there are some things which we constantly say that sound spiritual, but I don't think we mean. You know? Like when we say, come as you are, are you sure? Do you understand what I mean? People like to say things that sound nice, like, come as you are. But when people come as they are, we're like, mm-mm. You can't come like that. You understand? But you said, come as you are. Right? But when they come, they're like, don't come like that. So let me tell you, when I, I was having this conversation, and this is what I believe. I believe, believe that one of the reasons churches fall short is because church is the place that you have always taught from the beginning. To dress up. Sounds simple. Right? Because you're being you're telling them, no, but you're supposed to look, you're supposed to look good, right? I agree. I agree. But it therefore means that someone has been told that the, the way that people will not recognize I have problems is if I dress correctly. Okay? Come on in. Come on. Come on, in, you guys. Okay. Come on in, come on. Okay? I don't know what's name is gonna, gonna sit here. Okay? Where's Kiss Kelvin around? Um, no, no, not yet. Okay, come on. Okay? So church is the one place where we we've been told, as I was saying, all you need to do is dress up. And if you dress up, you look okay, right? It sounds so fickle and sounds so like I've broken it down, you know, you know, and made it so simple. But when you think about it, it's very true. That you have been told that the only way to show, to, to, to be accepted is make sure that you look acceptable. Okay? Meaning that I can cover anything that's wrong in my life as long as when I enter the church, I look acceptable. Okay? You won't see I have problems. You, you, you can, okay, can I bring it home? Can I bring it home? Okay, ladies know what I'm talking about. Okay? So on Sunday, someone wears a dress that is literally dragging, it's sweeping the floor. Right? But on Saturday, it's, there's not even a dress. It's a shit. So, it therefore means that the person who came on Sunday didn't come with a conviction. They concealed who they truly were. Right? Does that mean that we should accept everything? That's not what I'm saying. I think we should accept everyone and let God begin to help them as they grow. Okay? This is important, and I'm speaking to team leaders because I have known this as a pastor that the people who assassinate church members are team leaders. When the pastor's not there, they'll go to someone and say, "Mm -mm, You don't come like that. I experienced this firsthand, right? Coming into the church. I experienced this where somebody came to a friend of mine. My friend was wearing ripped jeans. And he called him and says, Ewan, do you see the way I'm dressed? 
you don't come to church. This is a guy, right? And the guy left church for a while, eh? All because of that. So, what we must under what we must strive to do is we must strive to help people look acceptable before God first. Okay? And not just acceptable before the pastor. Some people who look acceptable before me, trust me, they're going to hell. They're going to hell. They're going to hell because from the onset we've taught them to conceal who they truly are. That church is not a place to reveal. Church is a place to do what? To conceal. To conceal. That's the message we've given. That church, you conceal. You don't reveal. So, when we say growing community, what we're trying to say is that let this church not be Sunday service. The whole community be a place of vulnerability where people can come and be honest with one another. Okay? The Bible says in the book of James, confess your sins to what? To one another. Why? That there may be what? Healing. So can I propose that one of the reasons a lot of people are not healed in church is because we don't create an environment for confession. If we don't create an environment that is friendly, confession friendly, okay? Somebody comes today to tell you, look, you know, and this is facts. I'm, I'm HIV positive. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? This, this is life today. Right? If somebody comes to tell you, I'm having a baby. And the baby belongs to so and so, somebody who you know, who may be married, what are you going to say? We have to create an environment where people can come and be honest and say, where I am right now, I love God, I just don't know how to get there. Are we together? And I need your help to get me there. Okay? All together. The third thing that we want is we want to create a have a creative community. What is a creative community? Um, so one of the places that I'll share my heart with this. I, I said this on Sunday that the first thing that God was identified with is as a creator, right? Okay? But how many would agree with me that the last place ideas are welcome? Is a church <laughs> to change what we don't change, you know, you don't change nothing, it's the same. You don't change the order, you don't change this, you know, it, you know. So, let me tell you a story. So, one time, my one of my bosses at work tells us a story and tells us about night vigils at work at, at funerals. Do you know why night vigils started? Okay? At funerals. Why people came to sleep at the funeral. And why the men slept outside. And why the women slept inside. Okay. So, why it started was it was traditionally from the village. Okay? And men would sleep outside because you're in a village. And animals, come on in. Just come on in. Are you leaving stuff? Come in.
Ah, <laughs> sorry. I'm fine. So, I was just explaining about tradition. Thank you so much. That was good. Come. So, my, 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 my chief risk officer was telling me a story about how night vigil started. Uh, it was from the village. And in the village, there were animals. So the men slept outside and started a fire. Because the fire was meant to keep away. Right? And the women slept inside for security purposes. Because they could be, they were at risk if they were outside, right? But we just do it now for the heck of it. Like somebody died, start a fire. Like, <laughs> like, do you understand what I mean? Like, start a fire. Why are we starting a fire? You, you get what I mean? So we just carried on traditions like mindlessly without understanding the principle. Okay? I'm not telling you, no, don't start a fire because you, you start your own issues at, at that funeral. But you see, it's amazing how that tradition has carried on even though the environment has changed, right? So, there was a principle behind the method, right? But people fell in love with the method and not the principle, okay? It is the same thing with evangelism. I have shared my view on evangelism and said, this is the truth. If I critically look at it in the Bible, I don't think that door-to-door -door evangelism is doctrine. Okay? If it was, we would have seen that replicate in the letters that Paul wrote and in the epistles. But nowhere is it written that they went door-to-door. Okay? The Bible says they broke bread from where? From house to house, right? It doesn't mean that they went to knock do 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 No, 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 no. You understand what I mean? And, 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 and it's just like us now. It's not like we'll be now going every house to have bread before I preach to have bread. <laughs> right? I don't believe that evangelism is door-to-door. Is, is -door. I'll explain why. It was the principle that prior to that, you, the church never came to you. You went to the church. And Jesus came and broke that principle by saying, we are going to them, not them coming to us. Why did Jesus do that? Because he was signifying what he was doing. That I came down from heaven to you, not you going up to heaven. Right? And if I came down from heaven, you need to go to them. Okay? So the principle is about us going to them. The principle is about the church going to the community, not waiting for the community to come to the church. Okay? But we have taken it. And, and listen to me. For me, I think that God anoints even our foolishness. Because you genuinely believe it. You know what I'm saying? Your heart is in the right place. I've said this before. Just like when Joshua said the sun should stop. The sun doesn't move. But God was like, I know what you mean. <laughs> I got you. I'm not going to embarrass you, dog. You understand? But we've fallen in love with that method, which is great. But if you look at the way evangelism happened in the New Testament church, it was through the cell group. It was through the homes. They went home to home. Can you tell where was on the drum stop? It's Fred, yeah? Okay. Okay. But, but do you guys understand what I'm saying? So the point is this, is that somehow that I feel that as a church and as a community, as there's something that happens when we become spiritual. We stop thinking. You understand what I mean? We, okay, okay. <laughs> there are almost a hundred thousand homes here. If we went door to door, 
How long would it take us? You understand what I mean? Vis-a-vis -vis using the internet. Is the phone not in their house? Are you not in their house? And is the aim not for them to come? Are we together? Now, now, now. Once again, I say this in all honesty. I say this in all honesty and in all humility. That I'm not saying that whoever's doing that is wrong. It's just what they understand. Okay? But we've made principles and made them a doctrine. Okay? Same way for me that I don't believe in miracle money. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care. If it happened, it happened. I don't care. You can quote me. Okay? Don't make a miracle. Don't make a ministry out of a miracle. Okay? Samson used the jawbone of a donkey. Didn't mean that from that day onwards, he threw away all spears and just said, kill all the donkeys. We'll be using jawbones. Can it happen? Yes. Does that mean it's the way? No. You understand what I mean? Did water come out of a rock? Does water still come out of rocks? Do you guys feel me, right? So, what I'm trying to say is, as a church, and as leaders, I want, to, I want you guys to begin to think outside the box. Like that t-shirt. That's an amazing t-shirt. Can you see this? Remove it. Remove it. Remove your hands. Not the shirt. Not the stand, stand, stand. Stand. That's a very cool t-shirt. Says, think outside the box. Right? But if it was us, we would have written think outside. The box. <laughs> you can sit down. <laughs> Would have written it. Think. Underline. Outside. <laughs> <laughs> you understand what I mean? So there's, what, I, what that, what that t-shirt shows is that there's so many ways to convey a message. Right? Why don't we use creativity? Why don't we use? I want to inspire, to lead people to a place where they can, they can convey a message in different ways, okay? It was so interesting. The other day I received a video from Jehovah's Witnesses. I received a video talking about how bad the internet is from them, saying the internet will cause you to miss your job. How did they say it? Through the phone. <laughs> but what was so interesting was, now watch this, they did a video, a cartoon, right, mm -hmm. in Bemba. Shared it through WhatsApp. The same group of people who we say don't have the internet. Mm -hmm. Right? But these are people who have stats behind them, who know. I shared this other time in church. 75% of all Africans have a telephone. So if 75% of all Africans have a telephone, what's the most efficient way of communicating to them? Through their phone, right? And there's a view that very, very soon, the phone will not just become the primary method of communication, it will become the primary form of entertainment. Right? Creativity. Where are we leading? And are we doing it creatively? Are we thinking outside the box? Are we thinking creatively about our cell groups? Are we thinking creatively about our services? Are we thinking creatively about what we do in any area? You understand what I'm saying? Creatively. Creativity is a huge component because attention thrives off creativity. Attention is always drawn to what is creative. Attention. I mean, how many of you guys have ever seen the beginning of a, a football tournament, like the World Cup? There's this huge 
show. Like, what? Has nothing to do with football. Right? But they will fly in superstars all over the world, right? They will fly. And you know, you know what the principle behind is? They'll bring in musicians who don't even know anything about soccer to come and sing. Because they want the world to talk about that event. And if the world talks about that event, somebody might say, you know what? Maybe let me watch this tournament after all. Okay? And it's all about creativity is what is the expression for people. People are at their, at their best when they're in a creative environment. You get the best out of people when they're allowed to be creative. You know what I mean? Isn't it amazing, guys, that God knew each animal but still said, Adam, I think, let me see what you call it. You God ran out of names. But he was encouraging creativity in Adam, right? So Adam would realize, snap, I didn't know I could name animals. So I can't name animals. Where are, where are you leading? Are you encouraging creativity? Are you fostering an environment? Or are you stifling it? Those of you who work in institutions, big institutions, have you ever realized that whenever there's a problem in a business, the people on the ground know what the problem is? That when the bosses finally go to the ground, they'll even be told, this is the problem. You guys don't do this for us. But they never had an opportunity to give the feedback, right? So they didn't know there was a problem. I remember this happened in an institution where I work, where the CEO came and he didn't know there were such big problems. But the people were now like, yeah, you know, these are the problems. I, I was told that where we are, where we're, we're, we're in a region where mines are very important, right? And you know miners will kill you for that John Cena loaf and the milk. That's their way. <laughs> That's their wages. You understand, huh? And there was one time there was a serious problem at a mine with labor. Only to find out that it was because they took away those loaves <laughs> and milk. You understand what I mean? So what I'm trying to tell you is that don't, don't downplay the small things that you do that may not look like they have anything. Because I know as, as Christians, we like to say that, let's just get to the word. Let's just do the word. What do you think miracles were? Attention. Did Jesus really need to do miracles? No. But people recognize him by the miracles. And I think that miracles were his advertisement. Because when he did the miracles, people would talk about him. Right? And people would say the guy who, just like the man who was healed was blind, he says, I don't know. All I know is, and that guy healed me. Are we together? Creativity. Um, I think that I've expressed this before clearly that our church is more about church not just church growth but church health right let me also say this that we believe that our church will be is transgenerational okay but like in any population or demographic there's always a dominant group, okay? And if I can be very, very clear to everyone here, right? And I think it's important that you all understand what we're doing. We're designing a church for the millennial age. That is what the church is being designed for, okay? We are looking to reach millennials. Okay? Um, 
And for those of you who are wondering what millennials are, it's okay. Because it's, you can ask. It's a lot. But basically, millennials are 1981 to about 1994. Okay? 1981 to about 1995, no, so 1998, right? So 1981 to 1998. This is a very important period because this is a period and an age that was born in completely different circumstances. Can I give you a news flash? Whoever was born in the year 2000, this year is 19. I still can't believe people were born <laughs> in 2000. I met somebody that day, I was like, when are you born? 2003. I said, what? <laughs> You're what? <College> right? <laughs> but do you guys realize how out of touch we are with reality, right? Yeah. Because we're still thinking 84, 81, 79, you know what I mean? That's old. Okay? <laughs> born, I'm an 84, okay, I'm an 84, okay, so I'm 35 this year, okay, it clicked this morning, I'm going to be 35 this year, I'm entering the second half, <laughs> uh -uh. I'm entering the second half, you get what I mean? So how can me, who's in the second half, think the same as those who have not even, not even 10 minutes in the game? Right? If you see the way football games are played, or sports games, beginning of the game is just feeling it out, right? Uh-uh, second half, it's do or die. You throw everything. <laughs> the kitchen sink, everything. You know what I mean? You know, you know the game when you're down 1-0? Even the keeper is there at the corner. You know, the keeper's going to, because, hey, what the heck? What's the point of protecting a goal when we're losing? Right? So, we are building a church that is growing. It's a growing church. And there's a reason behind that. I've done my studies. I've done my assessment. And the assessment is this. The population of Zambia is about 70% youth. The entire population is about 70% youth. But our, most of our churches are not designed for the populace. Could it be that that is why they were not winning many souls? Okay? This, this is a fact. Because there's 70%. And you must understand, I, I told you the story on Sunday of how Pastor Bruce was had his baby, right? And the baby was like watching Teletubbies and the baby cried. But the minute Teletubbies came on, the baby was like, huh. I mean, I, if a Teletubbies comes on, I'm crying. I'm like, this is terrible. Right? But I don't understand why the baby likes Teletubbies. And I don't think I'm in my right to try and convince the baby otherwise. I have to respect that the baby will keep quiet when Teddy Tabis comes on. So my role is not to figure it out. My role is to use it to get the baby to do what I want it to do. Okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? So whatever we do, it is not the gospel. It is, it is a way of packaging it that they will get what they truly need, which is the gospel. Okay? And as leaders, we have to realize that there are no sacred cows. Okay? The only sacred cow is the message. The message never changes. The packaging changes. The cover can be redesigned. Okay? Translation can happen. Are we together? Second thing that we want to talk about is clear here. is process. Okay? This is our process. You should know this. If anybody asks you, what does Mount Zion stand for? And you say transforming lives, transform the world. And they ask you how. 
and said, this is what we believe. That first you must believe, then you must belong, then you must become. <clears throat> that has to be our language. We believe, we belong, we become. Whenever we go up in any way, it means that whether you are a cell leader, whether you are a team leader, whether you, are any, you have any form of influence, you have to figure out what you are doing to achieve this. Okay? You could be worship leading. Well, how is this part of this? You understand what I mean? You could be car park. How is this a part of this? You have to see it from the, from the mission, right? Not just your position, but from the mission, okay? From where you are sitting, you could have a very narrow view. But when you look from the entire mission, the bigger picture, you'll understand how your role is critical in the entire thing. Are we together? This is so important because I feel like as service leaders, volunteer heads, cell groups, it's very easy to just do things for the sake of doing it. And you don't understand why. Okay? So we know what? Believe, belong, become, become right? So everything we do to touch the community is to get them to believe. Social media, get them to believe. Right? Outreach, get them to believe. Okay? Jesus says, in this way, they will know that you, la you are my disciples. How? By the way you? By the way you do miracles. Okay? Can I take it deeper? Can I, can I go deeper? Okay, you guys. See, if I was a prophet, you'd have been giving me juice. You feel? These days, they even have like short come. Can I bro? <laughs> I like that one. Kapande, you are becoming my hype man this week, okay? That guy goes, sheesh. That guy in the back of the group, sheesh. Alright, I need that this week. So, get this. Get this. So, I need to start. Jesus, okay, the Bible says, Three things last forever. How many things? Three things. Okay. And what are those three? Faith, hope, and love, right? Yes. The greatest of which is? Love. So it means that when you're operating in love, you're operating in the highest spiritual element. See, we've been told faith, right? Faith doesn't work on its own. Galatians says faith works through love. So the greater power is love. How great will be our church if we walked in love? I heard a great story about your brother. Okay? Your elder brother. Somebody came to church, as now part of our church, was telling me, and you know her obviously, and she was telling me like she went through so much in life, and the only person who never judged her was your brother. And we always just say, let's pray. Let's pray. Do you know that that ministers to people more than anything else that you do? Learning to love the unlovable. The Bible says pagans are the ones who love those who can be loved. Believers must love the unlovable. That means the one who is a manipulator. You have to love them. You know what I mean? The one who is a backstabber. You have to love them. Don't get stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> but love them. You know what I mean? I mean, come on. How foolish was Jesus rolling with a, with a betrayer for three years? He didn't know. He didn't treat him any different. Having full knowledge of who he was. Right? Meaning love is, unconditional love means that what the person does should not dictate the way you love them. Love is a debt every man should give. Oh no man nothing, except love. Now you are owing everyone. <laughs> it 
No, no. Believe, right? So everything we do out there is to get people to believe. When you're at work, you're an instrument for belief. You get what I mean? Belong. So the second thing we do is that, and the primary tool, at the end of belief, what we hope is to see baptisms. Okay? Belong is an interesting place. Because it's belong that we have our Sunday service. Okay? And I feel like as team leaders, I need to break your mindsets. Because most of us, our mindsets are always around the service, not the church. The cell group, not the church. What I mean by that is that we're always thinking about, Kapande will be thinking about his camera, but not realizing that his camera is part of people belonging. You, you get what I mean? His mindset is just, I've done what you told me to do. Not just, I'm not talking about you, Don. Okay? Maybe, but. <laughs> but it's about people belonging, right? So, let me tell you this. Our Sunday service is designed, designed to reach the lost, period. Okay? It's not for you. It is not for you. Okay? It is a place where you serve, right? <clears throat> the message is for you, but the packaging, not for you. Okay? The message is always for everyone. But the way we design the service, we're not trying to get your attention. Okay? I want someone who is completely out to come and say, okay, I think I can come back. That's all we want. Somebody to come back. That's all we want. On Sunday, our idea is just to get people to come back. If we can get them in their seats long enough, maybe God can do something. If we can keep them coming to their seats, maybe God can do something. We, this thing of this thing of when people think that just one one service just changes. That's it. One one. When it become pressure, no mission. Every week I must come with that. You know, every four days. One life changing message. Anyway. Are you a product of one message? No. <laughs> Who is a product of one message? Can I can I take this deeper? Even Jesus is not a product of one message. Jesus said, I have come in, 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 in the volumes of whom it has been written about. Jesus was prophesied from Genesis all the way to Malachi. So if Jesus did not come out of one message, how can someone arise out of one message? You understand what I'm saying? So our job is to get people to just come back. That's all we want. We just want them to come back. Okay? So team leaders, volunteers, what we're trying to do is create an experience for somebody to say, I want to come back. Who's ever eaten good food in a bad place? Food was good, but the place was bad. And you're like, I'm never going back. So, it is possible, beloved, that the message can be good. But the environment bad. And a person says, eh, I watch online. Eh, I'll YouTube. We have to understand, why do we want them in the seat? Why don't we want them online? Because it's all about getting them to belong. We want them to grow in the community. So, when we come on Sunday, we have to create an environment. for. We have to think from the beginning to the end. How do we get an environment where a new person will say, I like that church. A non-believer will say, I don't know Jesus yet, but I think I want to find out. 
in the set. That's what we're thinking about. What is the, what is the, what is the hospitality of the usher in your choir? You get what I mean? What is the, the media that is required for this new person? What is the, the, the worship that is required for the new person? You get? You know what I mean? That explains now why we need lyrics. Because the person who's coming doesn't know the song. We should never assume they know the song. Somebody should be irate when there's no lyrics. Okay? That's why the worship leader should not presume everybody knows the song. And should tell us the song. You know what I mean? S say the lyrics. You get what I mean? That's why the, the, the coordinators must not presume everyone is from church. You understand what I mean? Because we say a lot of things, right? You know, the Lord of Zion will be on on Sunday. And someone's like, Right? Of course, it doesn't mean we don't announce an announcements, but the point is you explain what it is, you know what I mean? And we try and limit things which are non-corporate, like everyone on the pulpit. That's why we limit it. We limit it. Okay? I know people will be saying, no, what about birthday? We'll find ways of celebrating people. But if it's just it, this week, like this month, these guys are all born in January. All of them. <laughs> all of them. Yeah? Next to this week, Jeremy's birthday. Next week, Taylor's birthday. Hey, Nan's birthday. Yeah. You get what I mean? And then someone who's new is like, so who's there? <laughs> who's Jeremy? You know, you get what I mean? Yeah. What you always, you don't want to create an environment where a non member feels like some people know more than I do. Okay? Word of, that's a word of advice. That's why all those who coordinate, let's reduce on the inside jokes, you know? Because there's someone who's not there like, hey, what? What are we laughing about? Okay? We should laugh together. Basically, we want people to belong. And we want to point them to one thing. Be a part of our cell groups. Be a part of this church. Do you get what I mean? We want them to be a part of this church through membership. We want them to be a part of our cell group. That's why cell leaders on Sunday, your job is not just to come and lift your hands. Your job is to look for your members that they belong. Were you in church on Sunday? I didn't see you. Can I, can I come and see you? You, know, you get what I mean? And you look for new people. Hey, where do you live? Why don't you join my cell group? Do you get what I'm saying? Um, hospitality ushers. You know, it's like we be, it's like our, our our hospitality ends when we say amen. I could literally feel those boards drop. And <laughs> knock off like Fred Flintstone. Who remembers the way Fred Flintstone used to knock off in the middle of it? But isn't that what we do? Come on now. Isn't that what we do as a church? The minute we say amen, I don't have to be friendly to you anymore. I don't have to be nice to you. See, yeah, but that but do. <laughs> okay? I've heard so many people talk about, eh, this church doesn't feel like home. Listen, in your house, do you all sleep in the same room? You have different rooms. Right? But it's up to the family to create a family, right? <clears throat> it's up to the family to create a family. That means leaders, you have to be, this, is, this is, must be part of your consciousness. You don't just look for someone, that person is new, I've seen them. Who are they? I don't know, but I've seen them. Right? Your heart must be, if somebody comes for four weeks, three weeks, you, want, you, you need to ask, who, hey, how are you? Who are you? You know what I mean? Can I get to know you? Okay, in the Lord, in the Lord. <laughs> okay? So this is our process. We get them to believe, get them to belong. Then we want them to become. 
we become through training, right? We become through equip, we become through uh, days of rain, because we want them to now be servants, so that they can go out and get more people. Can you see the cycle here? Why is this important for team leaders, cell leaders? This is what you should be asking the members of your team. Where are you here? Are you, do you believe? Have you done baptism? Do you belong? Have you done membership? What's your spiritual growth plan? Do you guys hear me? We are here to produce Christians. Disciples first before we move into our gift, okay? We're here to produce disciples first before we move into our gift. This is so important, okay? Last thing, okay? Can I go back to, to the service? You know, um, for many years, um, we were like, in our church, um, Mohas, you remember Mercy in Mohas? You remember when we first closed, blinded, darkened the place, huh? And the initial response was like, mm. I remember when we, Mohas was a very, like has windows everywhere. So we bought lights. We wanted to give lights, but the only way to, to have light, guess what, is for darkness. You know? Until you make darkness, the lights won't be effective. So, I remember one time we darkened it for the youth. Quah, dark. So, someone came to me and said, no, -uh. God is light. <laughs> <laughs> I cackled, you know? Of course, I understand what they mean, you know what I mean? But what's with this all this darkness? Because, because God is light. I thought we hide. You know, wasn't my pastor though. My pastor's really cool. But it's at that point where I have to constantly let people know. And this is something that we must know. And let people know that we are trying to win souls. We're trying to reach the lost trying to touch the unloved, those who are far from God, those who are very far from God. And the further they are from God, unfortunately, some environments just don't feel comfortable for them. And the more I read this, the more I say, maybe this is why Jesus was found amongst the drunkards. He was found, he was found at the bar. Do you know Jesus was accused of drinking? Okay? The Bible says, he says that in the book of John, they approached Jesus and they said to Jesus, why don't you fast? Why are you always eating and drinking? Because Jesus had a ministry of eating and drinking. I don't know what that's drinking, but I presume it was 100% fruit juice. Okay? <laughs> we presume. Ah, no, no, please. <laughs> and, and what the Bible is silent on, we must be silent on. Okay? That's the way I believe. Mm -hmm. If you want, I think the Bible will be explicit. If you wanted to say, he did this, he did that. You know what I mean? Okay. So there's no, there's no emphasis on that. But they said to him, and Jesus said, when John the Baptist was here, he didn't eat or drink. In fact, he fasted. He called him a demon-possessed man. He says, I, the son of man, come feasting and drinking, and you call me a glutton and a drunkard. That's what I am. Now, what I believe is that Jesus was so close to these people that they thought he was one of them. What I what I believe is this. I think that we have a, a, a consciousness in the church where we've been told to cut off every non-believer. It's there. We let this know that. We've been told this over time. That, you know, they're not going where you are going. Cut! <laughs> 
<laughs> what if that man believes your father? Do you cut them off? We have to create an environment where even the unwelcome are welcomed. That means we have to care about everyone. Sunday we smile for everyone. Team leaders, I'm talking to you. Make your team smile. I was talking the other day to the band. The band one day was just like this. So I sent them WhatsApp, sort of them. I said, can you smile before you move from there? <laughs> They're playing. Uh, you, know, you know what I mean? And it was a joke, but you know. But this is so important. You know, Asher's. Make your guys smile. Okay, you guys never smile. It's okay. <laughs> Media, smile. Not like everything is just like you're late for the seven o'clock news. <laughs> you understand what I mean? <laughs> no, you know, you know why I say this, right? Because you know what happens in the church? We're, we're, we're so busy trying to get service running that we don't pay attention to the people we're here to serve. Right? The protector needs to be up. Because Pops is going to kill you. Yeah, he's going to kill you. <laughs> he is going to kill you. That's not a lie. Smile but smile while you die. You understand <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> you, you get what I mean, right? We don't have time for the people. Please, begin to make time for people. Make time for people. That brings me on to point number three. No ministry is complete without people. No ministry is complete without people. People are important. People, you know, listen to me. People are important. Okay? This is what I believe. Next phrase right here. This is my last line. It says, good leaders inspire and influence people into the vision. If you're going to be a good leader, you're going to inspire and influence people into the vision. Okay? That means... That you must be an inspirational and influential leader. Wherever you are, you must become inspirational. In other words, your conduct must inspire people. You must develop people. You must influence people to the, into the vision. People, do you know why we do testimonies, videos? You know why? Because it's for other people to see that person can do this. I can. Right? It's not complete without a story. So, and good leaders inspire and influence people. I hear you already. Some of you already, like, I'm not good with people. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. But can I tell you the truth? We are in the business of people. You better be. <laughs> you understand, right? You better be. And that, I, don't, I, don't, I do not miss my words about that. Jesus says, Peter, Peter, do you love me? If you love me, do what? Feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. So you cannot love Jesus if you don't love his sheep. Okay? I'm not a Peter. You've got to learn. Act. Fake. <laughs> then when you go home, ha! You know what I mean? Do, do what you need to do. Role play. You understand? I know some people don't like peopling. We call it peopling. Okay? <laughs> you don't understand because you, you wouldn't understand because you're a people person. Those who are introverts know what peopling is. <laughs> it tires them. No, no, no. Those who are introverted, I, I understand because, you know, I've learned to explain. Exp People tires people, okay? Where they just think of the crowd, before they've reached, they're tired. Okay, see my mom's dropping her head. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm not expecting you to be, ah! you understand what I mean? No, my expectation is in your own way, even if it's over the phone, you text, reach somebody, you know what I mean? Care for someone. It's not about the quantity, it's about the quality of relationships. 
we must be a relationship driven church <clears throat> relationships matter they matter okay I don't preach I don't need any of you I mean I once heard somebody preach this and really you know it affected me badly yeah I don't need you if I just have Bill Gates in this church the rest of you I'm like mm. <laughs> my man why are we here let's just leave let's, let's inbox Bill right now you know it's about people, right? We can have a great building, but no people. We can have great ministry, but no people. Good leaders inspire and influence people into the vision. What does that mean? That number one, you have to develop a team. You have to develop a team. Jesus, Jesus does something profound. Jesus is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, right? Then why in his mighty name, when his ministry starts, does he go and pick 12 people? When he was in heaven, he could do everything by himself, right? It says a principle. On earth, you can't do anything, everything by yourself. You can't. You must develop people. I'm talking to you. Tell leaders you'll be frustrated. Hey, they're not serious. They don't come. Develop them. Teach them, pray for them, coach them, raise them, pour into them. What we're doing here, I expect you to do with your teams. Wherever you lead a team. What we're doing here, I expect you to pour into the life of your members. Cell leaders, visit. Okay? Develop them. You're supposed to develop them. You, your role is to pick the people. The second thing that is important in, in influence and, and inspiration is consistency. Be consistent. Be consistent. Because one thing I don't like is people who have that chimuela. <laughs> you know that chimuela where this week they are fire! Quiet for two weeks. Then week four, fire! Again. You know? <laughs> like I hate that. I hate stop start. You know what I mean? I'd rather we move at consistently at a pace. You know what I mean? But I hate... Ah! Okay? So if anybody knows anything about me, is that for me, like I'm an all systems go person, like right now. You know what I mean? Like we can do this right now. You know? And I struggle with, you know, those who are... I need time. I'm learning. Right? But I struggle. You understand? Because for me, if, like, if I see something, I won't sleep till we do it. You know what I mean? That I, I don't mind losing sleep. I don't mind losing sleep. But I want you to hear me that one of the most inspirational things is consistency. Consistency. Are you a member of your, of your, your ministry consistently? Or are you a, I'm here this week as the leader? Three weeks. Okay? I know we all have calendars, but you will never lead a team which you don't consistently show up for. You will never lead a cell group that you're not consistently a part of. Right? It's about consistency. You have to do, and the third thing that you must do is be creative. You have to inspire people that you have to, excellence must be a part of you. You understand that? Huh? You don't just do things anyway, anyhow. Okay? Team leaders, the one thing I hate, I love when people like, okay, Pop, Pops likes this, he wants this, cool, you know what I mean? But creativity and excellence is where you even go beyond what I've asked. Okay? Think of the, 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 the par parable of the talents. The wicked one was the one who just did exactly what the boss said. It was considered wickedness. He said, you gave me one. Here's your one. You get what I mean? God has given you the ability to multiply and increase. Whatever you are given, your responsibility is to think beyond what you are asked. Right? 
How do I know this? Because the master said, if you knew I'm a wicked person, you should have put my money with the money changers. Right? So, responsibility is also inferred upon them. You get what I mean? You have to inspire excellence, creativity. You don't just do, like, if you're, let me explain. Like if you're called to just call five people, it's cool, just five people, five people, five people, five people. You know what I mean? Some days call ten. You get what I mean? Try. 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 You never go beyond what you're able to try, what you're trying to do. You know what I mean? Your ability for trying. Do something more. Do greater. Think. You know, as this is so important because we're not, we're not, we're not trying to, you guys are not caretakers. You get what I mean? The job of a caretaker, if you leave someone in your house, they're caretaker. It's just to leave it as you find it. You know what I mean? That's a caretaker. Yeah, I've left it as you have found it. But a leader gives it a future, grows it, looks beyond, works for more, inspires even more, comes up with ideas. I think we should do this. Executes. Time. You know what I mean? Not forever coming up with ideas and never doing anything. You understand what I mean? Or you're doing something and will take five years. That's leadership. If, if, if you don't have the authority to influence, impact. And, and let me tell you something. This is how people will follow you. When they see that you came, you brought ideas, you brought change, you brought growth. Okay? People will follow something that's growing. People are weird. People are ready to join a 10,000 member church. But they walk into a church with 10 people like, mm -mm, something wrong here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they're like, why are they 10? <laughs> Where did everybody go? Because there's just something about something that's working that draws people. So as a leader, before you blame everybody else that you're leading, ask yourself, what systems have you employed to bring the vision to life? Are we together? <clears throat> the last thing I want to give you is this. Hey, delegate. Hey. All of you say delegate. delegate. Say it again. Delegate. Say it louder. Delegate. <clears throat> But, but, you know why I say this? Do you know what most Christian leaders do, or leaders? They develop Jesus syndrome. Like, it can't happen without me. It must be me. If you're the only one who knows something in your team, you're a bad leader. You're the only one who can lead a cell group, you're not growing your team. If you're the only one who's following up, you're not inspiring people into the vision. If you're the only one who's recruiting, you're not doing your job. Your job is to lead. You cannot be the driver and conductor at the same time. <clears throat> you understand? This is important. Lead, delegate, give people. I thank God for all of you. I mean, it's good to see some of you have really grown in the area of leadership. And it's taught me as well because me, I, you know, I also had Jesus syndrome. I, I mean, before we had Jesus, you had to go, who were the ones who were doing, remember, we were doing intercession. From intercession, you even lead praise. You, you will never grow. Jesus syndrome. Even Jesus delegated. He said, ah, this, this ministry trip, I'm not going. It's near. The other ones are going. You tell me. You understand? Jesus had a treasurer. Jesus had an inner council. Delegation. Okay? Why is this important? Acts chapter 6 tells us <clears throat> this. In the book of Acts, the Bible says that when the, when the multitude began to grow, 
There were complaints that arose from the Hellenists, from the Greeks, that they were not receiving their portion. And the apostles gathered all the disciples and they said, let us call men of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, who are known to be leaders, that they may wait over tables and feed the people. That we, the apostles, can focus on the ministry and prayer. Okay? Everything that the church does allows me to focus on praying and on ministry. This is so important. If you're not doing your job, you're affecting the world. Fact. Okay? And we have to let people know. And something I'm learning now is, you know, unfortunately I'm one of those guys that if something is not, I don't like it. You know, even the worship team, I'll just be like, yeah, Jesus, take, you know, not the worship team. I mean, like, you know, I'll be like in that place. You know what I mean? Because remember, what we want is we want people to belong, right? Mm-hmm. So we want people to have an experience, an encounter, right? Mm-hmm. Somebody has to look. How can the whole church not see when one light is off there? It's off. It's off. Everybody's not. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everybody just. Either everybody has not seen it, or people don't feel empowered enough to say, excuse me, the light is off. You know what I mean? Are we together? So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to share today. Um, to say, we need team leaders. 2019 is going to be an amazing year. I'll say it again. 2019 is going to be an amazing year. Amen. I don't know if anybody has, has, has noticed the church in the last few months has grown at a pace that I, even I wasn't ready for. I'll be very honest with you. Even me who says, no, we will grow. I was like, eh, eh. We need to slow down a bit. And we have to start thinking and the way things are going, we're thinking of a second service as early as April. I was thinking of second service later in the year. But church growth specialists will tell you that when your church reaches 80% of a service, it's time to expand. And if you've noticed the last two weeks or so, no seats. We haven't had a chair problem in almost two years. We have a chair problem now. Okay? So if the church is growing, it means the leaders must grow. Right? You can't think the way we thought when we were 50. We're not 50 anymore. Do you know what I mean? You can't think the way we were when we started two years. We can't. We have to evolve. We have to grow. We have to get better. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. 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 Any questions? No questions. who was listening. I don't really see the number. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, it's, it's all good. But, um, yeah. Please feel free to talk to me. Are you sure you are? Does everybody understand where we're going? Do you understand what is expected of you? Do you understand what is expected of you? you said that um, I think what we all need to do is understand our role going forward yeah is it that 